Hello, my name is Teresa Piacentini and this is part two of lecture one in the topic self, society and belonging. And I've set out the aims of this lecture here. So we're going to be looking at how identity is conceptualised sociologically and how it has come to be debated. And if we remember, in this section, our focus is going to be on concepts. And concepts can be categorised in lots of ways. They can refer to something we observe or something that is an inferred phenomena. They are malleable, meaning that there is often debate as to their definition and what they refer to. Some concepts are taken for granted, but in fact, highly contested. And in this lecture recording, we are going to be focusing on the key sociological concept of identity. So where to begin? Um, let's look first of all at the kind of historical origins of the concept of identity. Right. And its roots can be found in the United States from a social science perspective and has particular salience with identity concerns, um, specifically in response to mass society of the 1950s and the 1960s, generational rebellions, such as the rise of black power and other ethnic movements and political movements, for example, women's liberation, anti-war, disaffected youth, uh, the rise of mods and rockers, for example, in the UK, which we'll be coming on to look at. And the concept of identity entered the social sciences in the 60s as a category of analysis. So thinking back to uh, Brubaker and Cooper, and it has come to permeate social, political practice and analysis since. And it's largely been concerned with the way in which individual identity has been kind of transposed to the group level. So if we think about um, women's rights, for example, and group identities are often treated as the most powerful forms of identification in terms of their capacities, whether they are rooted in socialization, in peer pressure, perceived or shared interests, but the capacities to mobilize people. And if we look at this quote here from Jenkins, um, we can begin to kind of unpack this concept that seems to make intuitive sense to most people, I would imagine, because identity means who you are, right? And what Jenkins provides us here is with a kind of overview of the starting point for us to begin to think and unpack and unpick this concept. So it relates to the human capacity to know who's who and therefore what's what. And that means that we require it, that we know who we are and we know who others are and them knowing who we are and us knowing who they think we are and so on. Jenkins refers to this multi-directional mapping of our social world, so it cuts across public and private spheres. It's something that you do, um, so rather than being something that one has, um, and in that sense, it is also uh, relational, right? It is a process it is something that helps us, that emerges through social interaction. To be identified requires someone doing that very identifying itself. So we can see from this that there are lots of different ways of how we might begin to even talk about identity. But even from that overview from Jenkins, we can see that identity has a lot of work to do. It is therefore um, the basis of social and political action and is also a product of social or political action. It can be specifically a collective phenomenon, so it requires some kind of sameness of members of the same group. And these are some different ways of understanding identity that can overlap but can also be in contradiction with each other. So it can emphasize sameness, but also reject the very notion of sameness. If we understand 
identity as a core aspect of selfhood, something very deep and basic and foundational, it then comes to take on the meaning of being a thing that one possesses. So it can take on this sense of it being a condition which implies roundedness and, and, and sameness. How does that work? Well, if we take the example of a religious identity, the implication that there is a common identity shared by all people who practice the faith in question. And then we can also understand identity as something that is multiple and fluid and contingent. Um, that is contingent upon social relations and interactions. But if that's the case, how do we understand ways in which it comes to be crystallized so it takes on this kind of sense of something concrete and if it's multiple then how do we often understand the often dangerous singularity striven for by politicians seeking to transform categories into single unitary groups it's complicated and brubaker and cooper argue if identity is everywhere then it is nowhere Let's have a, a look at identity talk in action. And what I'd like you to do is pause here. So literally pause this recording and watch the short clip that's accessible on the storyboard resource. So that's on the, the wait clip that's embedded in Moodle for topic two under week five. And it's really important that you do pause here and watch this clip because what I'll be going on to say We'll be making reference to what you will watch and also will make more sense. So having watched this short clip, I think it works really well at highlighting some of the hard work that concept of identity does. And if we think about Reza Aslan in this clip, his so-called Muslim identity has been seen as dominating any other he may make claim to his identity as a scholar, his identity as an expert, his identity even as a Christian. In this exchange, his scholarly identity is minimised, it is even disputed. There is a focus on his faith, which arguably is something private, um, so something for the private sphere and therefore not a public identity. And there's also a suggestion in here that it is somehow, in some way in his DNA that as a Muslim, he is incapable of seeing beyond his faith and that this would somehow cloud his judgment. In fact, in this interaction, his faith becomes the most compelling aspect of his reality rather than his years of experience and expertise and training. And as you'll see in this clip, despite self-identifying with multiple social identities, as he insists over again, over and over again, he is continuously categorized as a Muslim. And this was seen as not only de facto, but highly problematic. His so-called Muslim identity here is used to suggest not only what people do, but what they should be prevented from doing. So what's interesting here is that because of these ways of um, imposing identities upon him, there are different boundaries popping up. And it's really important to make this point here that this all happens through interaction. So this is where we think about identity as relational, right? It emerges through social relations. Identity is not about the individual, but also how we see ourselves and how we are seen by others. And here, Brew Baker and Cooper set out what they see as the kind of key problem with identity, right? They see it's a key term, uh, an everyday idiom in politics and social analysis, but it doesn't require us to use identity as a category in analysis or to conceptualize identities as something we all have. And this goes back to his point where he says, if we talk about all forms of belonging, of experience, as identity, then it leaves us with a blunt, flat, undifferentiated vocabulary. Now, identity is a key concept, right? 
Um, and it means, but if it means everything and everything comes to be conceptualized as related to identity, then it means nothing. And this is what's really important about the paper that they've written beyond identity. So in other words, what they're arguing is that identity is ambiguous and blunt, it is unclear, it lacks precision, and it's therefore not helpful. And when used in an uncritical way, it means nothing. It does, they argue, nothing to sharpen our ways of understanding, seeing, and talking about our social worlds. They argue it becomes reified, um, a concept comes to be crystallized as a powerful and compelling reality. When we reify identity, we look at it and think about it as if it were a fact of nature, as if it were not a product of human activity. Now, what this does is it fixes boundaries. It makes identity some kind of condition that produces and it stops us thinking about it as a process that you're producing as you live your life. And as a result, they argue, it creates this fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And it extends beyond the individual. And you'll see this from the clip you've just watched and also the tutorial reading and the other clip that I've asked you to look at. Because what we see there are ways in which Reza Aslan is cast, categorised, classified and held accountable as an individual and as a member of a so-called community, and you'll be looking at this in the tutorial activity. We see identity not as a thing, but it's actually something produced in this interaction. And we saw both parties looking at identities and self-identification as something quite different. And really, this links back to the overarching theme of this topic, where we look at the relationship between self-society and belonging. What happens in that interview is the insistence on particular identities actually excludes Reza Aslan from making claims to belonging to other communities of practice. For example, the scholarly community. And the Brubaker and Cooper article is it is a challenging read, right? So please do stick with it. It's, it's, it's quite dense and it's quite complex, but it actually is a very significant piece of writing and it's quite groundbreaking because they go off not just from a critique of identity to proposing some terms that force us to think sociologically with the concept of identity. So they force us to think about when we use a particular term, when it isn't used, how we use it, the context, who is doing the identifying, to what end, and so forth. And they suggest rather a cluster of concepts rather than the single concept of identity. So the first one is self-identification and categorization. And these are not the same. Both terms are necessary because they invite us to think about or specify who is doing the choosing and the grouping. But this term, these terms, self-identification and categorization, have the advantage of removing the tendency to make identity out to be some sort of essential, unmovable thing which has no agency or no agent. So it's a shift from identity being a thing that someone possesses towards identification as a process. And it prompts us to ask, who is doing the identifying and why? And I think the clip really expertly shows this process in action. The second part of their cluster of concepts are self-understanding. And this suggests something a little more subjective. So our sense of who we are, our position in society, which nevertheless changes over time. And this also informs our decisions about whether or not we overtly signal belonging to a group larger than ourselves. Self-understanding lets us discuss how we understand our relations of distance or proximity with other people. And self-location may be another's understanding of where we fit in society, but it doesn't impose certain identities upon us just because that's where we fit 
and the term identity tends to imply this. The last part of their cluster of concept framework is around connectedness, commonality and groupness. Commonality describes something in common. Connectedness refers to some kind of relational tie. And groupness, a sense of belonging to a distinctive, bounded group. And it's important to note that we can feel connected to others without feeling groupness. We can have things in common without being connected or feel we belong to a group. But if we have things in common and feel connected, then there may be a sense of groupness. The point being, we need ways to understand multiple forms of commonality and connectedness and the varied meanings attributed to them of closer or looser ties and affinities. And the tutorial activity, I think, provides an interesting space to explore the value of this cluster of concepts approach. Jenkins largely agrees with Brubaker and Cooper about the kind of the need to critically engage with the concept of identity, but also asks, well, what should we do with this concept, right? Identity is an established sociological and anthropological concept. Discarding the notion of identity for analytical purposes is no solution. The genie, Jenkins argues, is already out of the bottle. This is not to suggest that because it is a well-established concept, it should be used uncritically. Identity also features in a host of public discourses from politics to marketing to self-help. So Jenkins asks, don't we need one of sociology's words of power to talk about the world outside of academia? And this is a very real issue. And goes on to say, we still need a way of talking about fundamental human processes, about knowing who's who, and the fact that people are, in their own eyes and in their eyes of others, identified as this or that. But we do need to understand the social processes at work. And Jenkins argues, is it a compromise that we can reach between a complete rejection of identity and a more critical engagement with its use? So how should we talk about and write about identity? Well, we need to recognise the limitations when it comes to explaining or predicting behaviours, and especially if we see it as something passive. When it comes to identity talk, we need to be specific and think of the relationship between sociological concepts used in the everyday and used in a sociological way. We need to be cautious of reification, so turning something into a compelling reality. Um, and we need to be aware, aware of this sense of misplaced concreteness. And we should unpack the processes of identification and consider the wider context within which identification occurs and the consequences of identity talk often most consequential when we are categorised as having a particular identity rather than when we self-identify. And we should just be careful not to uh, fall into the trap of taking identity at face value. And there are very real consequences to this. And in the reading list, you'll see references to, for example, Brubaker's paper of 2013, where he sketches some ways in which the use of Muslim as a category of practice um, has changed in recent decades but also cautions against an uncritical use of Muslim as a category of analysis. So he engages with this category of the, the concept of a Muslim identity. Jean Beeman, in her book, Citizen Outsider, looks at middle-class and upwardly mobile children of North African immigrants, or Maghribans, and she shows how these individuals are denied cultural citizenship in France because of their North African origin. And Crawley and Scliparis explore in their paper um, what they call categorical fetishism in relation to refugees and migrants. And this needs to categorise uh, people's identity along the lines of their immigration status. And they argue that if we're concerned about the use of categories to marginalise and exclude, then we need to also engage with the politics by which categories are constructed, the purpose they serve and their consequences. And actually, 
these are really important points, the point about how we use concepts and thinking about when they are used and by whom and what powers, power structures they reproduce is something we'll be exploring across this topic. And there's a key point here about the use of concepts is shaped politically, socially, culturally, historically. We need to be thinking critically about concepts in terms of their analytical value not just use them because they have entered everyday language. And if we do that, we can avoid unintentionally reproducing or indeed reinforcing concepts as compelling realities. In this lecture, we've done this through looking at, to, we've begun to do this by looking at the concept of identity. And just some last points. If we remember Thinking sociologically requires us to develop skills in defining concepts and using them carefully and with rigour to describe the social world around us. So the argument is not about what categories and concepts we should use, but how we should use them. And the clip and the tutorial activity will give you some space to unpack this further. But as social scientists, we should consistently adopt a critical stance towards categories of practice and the categories of analysis that we use. Being able to define sociological concepts clearly and precisely and use them in a careful and rigorous manner to describe and classify and analyse and explain our social world are key aspects of thinking sociologically and are central to the development of our sociological imagination. <laughs>